Welcome to The Mastering Show. This is the show where we cover all aspects of mastering, and we bring it to you every week. I'm Steve Cherubino, just one of your hosts, and also joining me, our other co-host, our resident mastering expert, Ian Shepard. What's up, Ian? Hi, Steve. How are you? Not too bad. I'm losing some pounds these days. I've been eating different. I changed my diet around. I feel really good. Good for you. I sh- See, I shouldn't have eaten that chocolate that I just had. And I probably shouldn't drink this glass of whiskey, but I'm going <laughs> to. You know what happens when you eat really good food? You feel like exercising. It's, it's a pleasant That's thing. an interesting theory. I might have to test that. Yeah, all right. Give it a shot someday. Anyway, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Um, I've just been doing my accounts and it's a nightmare, but nobody wants to know about that. That's painful. <laughs> what are we talking about today? This week is compression. So we're working backwards through the chain. We'll end up with the source material. Um, so we did uh, limiting last week. This week is compression. Next week will be EQ. Sweet. Um, you, so how do you feel about compression? I think uh, loads of people say to me they just don't understand what it is or what it's for. Do, is that, would you say you agree with that or have you got it now? I've got it now, but you know, the first couple years of being an audio, it was a bit of a mystery to me until I basically turned all the knobs on my compressor enough times to their full limits back and forth and just played with it enough that I, I just got it. I finally got it. It's a tricky one. I mean, I think there's, I think it's a bit of a catch 22. I think the problem with compression is you don't know how to make it sound the way you want it to until you know what to do with the knobs but you don't know what to do with the knobs until you know how you want it to sound. Right. (laughs) And you're kind of, so what I always say to people is the, the, the thing that was said to me, which is that the point of compression is to make things louder. Um, now actually there's a load of other reasons to use compression, especially when you're recording and mixing, but particularly in mastering, I think, like I said in, in previous episodes, my goal is always to be invisible in what I do. Right. And I think if you want to be invisible with compression in mastering, you probably don't want to do a bunch of the things that you might have done when you were tracking and mixing. Um, and I kind of give you some examples of that as we go along. Okay. Um, but the, and of course the other thing to say is that it's not all about making things loud because that's not what I believe mastering is about. But it does enable you to make things loud. And when you're doing that, you change the sound in certain ways that are really useful. So I think that's a, it's a good place to start with that as a kind of goal. And then when you've kind of got your head around how that works, then you can kind of move out from there and start exploring other aspects of it. I didn't think you were going to say that, just to make things louder. Because, you know, the nature of a compressor is to compress the sound. Well, that see, that's one of the paradoxes. That's why I didn't understand it. And that's why it helped me when somebody said the idea was to make it loud. So, yeah, somebody said to me, okay, so when the sound, when the, when the level crosses the threshold, it comes in and it reduces the gain and that makes it quieter, right? So then you turn up the makeup gain and it gets louder again. And at that point I was like, well, so what is the point? Right. <laughs> um, but of course the point is that when you're when you go through that process, what happens to the sound is that the louder moments get turned down. And then when you turn the whole thing up, the quieter sections come up. Right. And if you use the makeup game. If you use the makeup game, or if you have a compressor that has auto makeup game, which is kind of common these days with the digital stuff. Right. Um, and that's how you use a compressor to make things louder. Right. And in mastering, that's kind of the point. I mean, really, the point is to control the dynamics. So the dynamics are the the kind of the shape of the sound in terms of the loud and the quiet moments, right? right. And if you think of something that's really dynamic, like a voice or maybe a bass guitar um, or drums, the contrast between the loud and the quiet bits can be pretty extreme. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, a common example that everybody knows about is where you have a lead vocal in a song and you know, it, it sits fine with the track during the, the chorus. And then when the, in the, in the verse where the energy in the vocal maybe reduces slightly, it kind of suddenly gets buried in the mix. Right. And that's the point where you could reach for a compressor. Um, not necessarily. 
And I'm going to return to that idea at the end of the show when we talk about my mastering maxim for the week. Oh, that's a good maxim. I can't wait for that one. But yeah, that's the usual point of compression. If you can, if you, so what you do is you control the loudest moments in the chorus. So they're not quite as loud as they were. That means you can turn the whole thing up without causing distortion or any other kind of problems. And because you turn the whole thing up, the quieter moments in the verse come through. And that has lots of other nice effects, like all these kind of subtle little details that otherwise might get lost in the track, become more audible. So that's one of the the benefits of of compression. One of the things that I like to say to people in terms of how you set, how you figure out what you want it to sound like, is to imagine uh, your music as a boxer. That probably makes no sense. Um, But imagine, I mean, I'm not a boxer, so um, this is all imaginary in my head. So if there are any people listening who actually are into boxing and I'm getting it all wrong, then I apologize. But um, the if you imagine somebody shadow boxing, you know, just kind of, you know, m- making the moves, punching the air, that to me, that's not very satisfying because the whole point about boxing is you punch something um, and you've got nothing to punch, right? You're just waving your hands in the air. Right. Whereas if you've got... A punch bag it's it's custom built to be punched right it's just the right weight for you um it's just got just the right amount of padding so that when you hit it you kind of your fists make a really satisfying contact with it it gives just enough so that the punch feels satisfying and it feels good you can build up a rhythm it moves somewhat so that you can kind of build up some momentum i think a boxer kind of you know with a a really good punch bag is a really great analogy for a compressor that's set up really nicely. Because we're always talking about punch in audio, oh. right? And punch for me is where you've got just that, you know, where the drums are just kicking enough and the, the guitars have just enough bite and the vocal cuts through just enough. And that's when the compressor is perfectly balanced. So that's one way of suggesting you set up a compressor well, is to imagine you're punching a punch bag. If you look at that in a bit more detail, go back to the, the guy with no punch bag just boxing the air. One stage better than that might be if you were punching a pillow, right? Then you've got a little bit of resistance. Um, it's really soft. It barely slows your fists down it's at all. not satisfying. Not satisfying. That's kind of analogous to a low ratio in a compressor, right? Because a low ratio only just reduces the gain ever so slightly. Um, the threshold of the compression is when you hit the pillow, right? So that's kind of how close the pillow is to you. If you step that up and think about punching a beanbag, that's going to be a little bit better because you've got, you know, it's it's bigger, it's a bit more kind of, got a bit more mass in there. So that's a slightly higher ratio. It's slowing your fists down a little bit more. Um, maybe your fists get quite deep into it. If it's too close to you, that's like having the threshold in a compressor too low because you basically can't get a decent swing in. You know, you're just kind of smothered by this thing. Um, if the threshold is too high, if the beanbag is too far away from you, you're barely making contact with it, right? right? right. Um, so it's not really doing very much that's useful. Now think about punching a sofa cushion, you know, the, the, the ones that you sit on. Mm-hmm. They're kind of fairly firm foam. Um, that's probably a bit more satisfying, you know? That's probably yeah. uh, like a two-to-one ratio on a compressor maybe, Um you know, and if you get it the right distance, especially if it's kind of supported in some way, that's probably going to be pretty good. A sofa with leather cushions, that's probably a four to one ratio in my head. I don't know you. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. You know, and I've even, punched it, a lot of sofas, so I think I get it. Oh, you have? Well, okay. Yeah. Maybe we should talk about that later. <laughs> um, and then, like, so, so, so to go beyond that to a, a more extreme example, if you think about uh, a crash mat, you know, the kind of thing that you use if you're uh, doing judo or some kind of contact sport that you have on the ground, if, if you have one of those, they're they're really firm, they're pretty thin. That's that's a really high ratio compressor. Your fist stops pretty quickly, and it's quite a, a jolting kind of experience. Yeah? If it, if it's on the floor, or if it's kind of hanging on a wall and you're punching and there's a wall behind right, it. Right, right, right. Um. And then kind of the extreme example, I mean, actually, I would say probably a crash mat up against a wall is probably more like a limiter than a compressor because it stops the musical signal. It stops your fists so hard and so fast. You would rather say that that's a limiter rather than a brick wall 
Well, I, a brick wall is pro- a brick wall with bare knuckles is probably digital clipping, right? Right. <laughs> Where right. you're just crashing up with no- nothing there at all. Um, maybe a brick wall with 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 gloves on is a brick wall limiter. If you um, see blood, then you're clipping. Exactly. Um, so yeah, that's my analogy for and and the the thing that kind of brought that to me was just that when I would be talking to people in attended sessions, I'd I'd find myself punching my hand. <laughs> and that actually is a top tip. If somebody is like, what am I doing with a compressor? Try, just just imagine your fist is the music, your hand is the compressor. How are you hitting? You know, if you're going, if you're really hitting it, then that's a high ratio. That's a kind of, that's a, either a limiter or a really high ratio compression, compressor. If you're kind of just kind of, you know, your hand's giving and you're just kind of rolling along, that's probably a, a pretty low ratio, you know, not too much compression. And if you're kind of, it's a good solid punch, then that's probably, my favorite is the is a two to one ratio as a starting point. Okay. I think most people, if you go for a two to one ratio with a compressor, in mastering especially, you know, it's enough to be doing stuff that's useful, but it's, I mean, really anything above four to one is getting close to limiting. So the thing that horrifies me is when people say, oh yeah, I stick a four to one ratio compressor on everything to start with. And then, and I'm like, whoa, talk yeah. about overdoing it. You know, it's, right. I mean, how about you? Have you, have you been in that situation did, or did you always yeah. start with low comp- ratios? What was your kind of compression journey? Yeah. Between two and four for me is where I, where I usually sit. And see, I do a lot of podcast editing, so it's basically a lot of spoken voice. And, uh, I got really good at using the compressor, um, to, to kind of, basically what you said in the beginning to tame, just basically tame the signal. So it's not music, so it doesn't really punch you. I use it more as just something that's not, that you don't want to get punched when you're listening to a podcast, basically. So I use it more like that. Um, yeah, but no, that, that's what I've experienced. And uh, I, I love the whole boxer analogy, man. You came up with that? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I am really pleased with it. It's uh, I, I mean, I, I put it in a blog post years ago, and it's still one of my favorite things that, that I've written. I, I, in fact, because of that, I got asked to do an article for a magazine where I had to come up with something different. So my other version of it was like the suspension in a car, but it's not as good as the punching thing. No, because, the punching thing. Because, I mean, you could picture Rocky when there's a punching thing. Exactly. And it's, and if you, yeah, if you just, I, I really think that the, the analogy of with a punch bag, because when you've got a compressor that's really working with a song, it, it controls it, but it adds to it, you know, it, it mm-hmm. kind of builds up a rhythm of its own and it, I think the thing, what I hear a lot of, I think I mentioned it briefly last week when we were talking about limiters, people, you know, that idea that mastering used to be only limiting an EQ. Right. Um, People take that idea and use it to try and achieve modern levels of loudness. You're never going to get the kind of, what I would say is the bounce of a compressor just using a limiter, right? Because it's just like punching a crash mat against a wall. There's no... There's no give, there's no swing of the punch bag to kind of give you a moment to recover and pull your fist back for another punch. You know, it's just non, non-stop. And to have against... rhythm, basically. Yeah, I think if you get the, the compressor compression right, it does add, it's it's you know, it's the point where everybody starts nodding their heads, you know, yeah. is when you know that it's working. Huh. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's a really good um, analogy. Yeah, me too. I love it. So I mentioned there um, that, I love a two to one ratio as a starting point. You know, you can you can dial it back if you feel that it's too aggressive. You can wind it up if you need something harder hitting. It's a great kind of middle ground area to start with. Um, the other parameters that a compressor has that uh, you know, kind of people are always asking about is the uh, attack and release times. So, Steve, what's your favorite attack time? Oh gosh, I don't know numbers. I know where my dial is on my compressor, and. I'd like to get your take on this too. Um, a lot of compressors come with an automatic attack and release. It's like an auto button. And I, I'll, I've used that for the longest time before I could really felt like I had control of attack and release. I don't know the number, but I kind of leave it at default, to be honest, <laughs> for most of my stuff. No, that's cool. I mean, it, I, you know, d- this is, on the one hand, I would kind of say presets are the devil and don't ever use a preset. On the other hand, they can, you know, presets are settings that somebody has spent a lot of time thinking about there's a good chance they're going to be a good place to start yeah um and the default setting of a compressor is kind of the most basic preset so the auto stuff i think that depends on on which compressor you're using 
there are some where it works really nicely and there are some where I just hate it. Right. So I, th- I think that's a kind of suck it and see kind of thing for me. Okay. Um, I'm more inclined to go with an automatic release time than attack time uh, f- for whatever reason. I mean, it's interesting you say you don't know the numbers because um, just recently I've been testing out the uh, FabFilter Pro MB, the multiband compressor, uh-huh. and that doesn't have numbers at all. Um, that has a percentage for attack and release. Really? So that was an interesting kind of uh, place f- to to kind of a way of coming at the, the thing because I was like, well, I don't know what to do with that because the, the number I'm going to suggest people, which may surprise a lot of you, is... 100 milliseconds. I recommend starting out with an attack and a release time of 100 milliseconds and seeing where that gets you. Mine is a default of 120. I'm just looking at it now. Okay. Now, that's interesting because lots of people go much uh, faster, have a much shorter attack time. Huh. So you often, I often see people talking about 10, 20 millisecond attack times. Oh, you're I think, talking about it. I thought you meant release. My bad. Uh, no, no, att- attack time even. Oh. I mean, I'm, so you're I'm saying, saying attack time, 100 milliseconds? There you go. See, that's the reaction I usually yeah. get. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And here's why. By the time you get to mastering, there's probably a whole lot of compression that's already happened. So I'm not saying 100 milliseconds necessarily in a mixed situation. Oh, you're talking about for mastering? I'm talking specifically for mastering as a starting point. I think 100 milliseconds works. And my reasoning for that is... A, there's going to be a lot of compression that's already happened. And B, uh, short attack times, the the compressor is going to start working during the transient of the sound. Okay? So, uh, incidentally, we should quickly dispel a myth that lots of people, uh, a misunderstanding that lots of people have about compression. The attack time is not the time that the compressor waits before doing anything. The attack time is the time it takes to do whatever it is you've told it to do. Okay, so let's say your compressor is set up so that uh, your drum hit is going to trigger three dBs of gain reduction at, at, at the maximum. Yeah. Okay. So the attack time is the time it takes the compressor to go from zero dBs of compression to roughly two dBs of compression. So about two thirds of the maximum amount that it's going to apply after you've crossed the threshold. Right. So it's, it's a, on a slope. It's on a slope. It doesn't wait three. Uh, 100 milliseconds, say, oh. and then start turning the gain down. It's All compressors always start, well, all all standard compressors start reducing the gain immediately. I see. So it's just a question of how, how, how steep that slope is, whether it, it gets to the maximum gain reduction really quickly or whether it takes a bit longer. And there's no so, curve. It's always a straight slope. Well, you can have this thing called the, the knee. We're kind of getting oh, a, ahead of ourselves the there. Okay. The knee is the, is the transition between uh, the... Well, it's, it's the top of the slope, right? The beginning of the slope is always straight because it's below the threshold. So it's a, it's a one-to-one ratio, right? But at the point where it crosses the threshold and you the ratio starts to change, that change can either be sharp or soft. And that's the knee. That's when you talk about a hard or a soft knee. So whether you get a very abrupt change in terms of the gain reduction that you're hearing or whether it's more gradual. Wow. Thank you, Ian. That's okay. That was just a, that right there was worth the price of admission. <laughs> okay, so uh, 100 milliseconds is is long by most people's standards. So the first thing to say is remember we have a limiter after the compressor, right? Always basic minimum requirement for mastering, as far as I'm concerned, is a high quality limiter to catch any peaks. And since the peaks are likely to be the transients. And since limiters are really good at catching transients and controlling peaks without causing distortion and making it sound crappy, let the limiter do its job. It doesn't matter if the transients of your sound get th- past the compressor okay. because the limiter can handle them cleanly. Got it. What the limiter can't handle cleanly is, is the kind of the body of the sound, the, the stuff that follows on. So if you think about uh, a bass guitar, right, you might have a big click at the beginning, a big, you know, kind of the sound of the plectrum on the string. So you've got a big spike at the beginning, and then you've kind of got the sustained tone of the note. A limiter can control that click on the guitar really nicely if you don't push it too hard. But if you have a limiter dialed in so that it actually cuts into the body of the note, it's going to sound really odd because it's going to be kind of attacking and releasing constantly. You'll get this, well, that's when it's, things start to sound distorted because it's basically attacking, releasing too fast and too aggressively. 
Whereas a compressor with 100 milliseconds attack time is basically going to miss that transient. Right. You know, nothing much is going to happen while the transient is going through, but it will compress nicely and sensibly the body of the note. Okay. So it can just hold back that level and keep some consistency from note to note and let those transients go through. If you dialed that attack time right down so that it was fast enough to control the attack of the bass guitar note, it's not as effective to me as a limiter. And very often it kind of, it takes all the life out of it. Huh. Especially if you've already had, I don't know, a compression and some people use transient designers, all kinds of stuff, right. getting things to sound right in the mix. It also has a nice effect that it can actually help you add some punch, right? Because it keeps the initial impact of the note and then it controls what comes after it. I see. So it's a good place to start. Um, there are times when you want to dial it back to get more control quicker. There, are, there probably aren't many times where you're going to want to go even longer. Um, but so it's it's not a kind of cast iron rule. But again, it's a, it's a great place to start. And the the basic concept is that the compressor is controlling the body of the sound and let the limiter handle the transients. Okay. And I like long release times as well, relatively speaking. Um, which is why, again, I suggest kind of 100 milliseconds is not a bad place to start. Well, now that you cleared up attack time, can you tell us what release is in case we got it wrong? Well, it's just the opposite, right? So release time is the time it takes to restore two-thirds of the gain that it was taking out. So the signal crosses the threshold, the compressor starts working, and it takes the attack time to get to two-thirds of its maximum gain reduction, depending on where your threshold is, right? Yep. If you have a very short release time, the, the gain reduction will very quickly switch off. So the sound will jump back to the level it would have been if there wasn't a compressor there. Right. If you have a longer release time, it takes longer for that to happen. So to use an extreme example, if you have a high ratio, a fast attack time, and a long release time on a bass guitar note, the twang at the beginning of the note will be pulled back and then you might even hear the note kind of vroom, come back up again as the compressor releases yeah I see. whereas if you have a very short release time it will very quickly that the compressor will very quickly let go of the audio signal and allow it to spring back to its original gain that can work well if you want to avoid that kind of breathing effect that a longer release time can have but if you go too short, again, it will start to sound distorted or weird. So percussive type sounds usually want to have a quick release so the compressor is kind of armed and ready for the next transient. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a fair um, thing to say, um, except that we're in mastering, we're working on the whole mix. So you've got a whole load of stuff in there. And a lot of the impact of percussive sounds is in that very short initial section not necessarily the transient but the first bit of the note and if you've got a long attack time the compressor may not be doing a huge amount to those anyway so you well okay let's the funny thing is the way that i use compression in mastering i don't agonize about this stuff too much when you use it with a fairly gentle ratio like two to one and if in mastering, I'm probably only compressing two, three, four dBs, like I'm only allowing the limiter to do two, three, four dBs of gain reduction. Okay. It's all pretty subtle. In fact, I'm currently working on a new product for readers of my website called Home Mastering Compression and Limiting. Um, and I'm, I have example songs and I'm trying to show the effects of long versus short attack and release times. Cool. And the the thing that's that's actually quite challenging for me to do, because most of the stuff that I'm dealing with, the settings or the the amount of compression that I'm ending up with, changing those parameters doesn't make a huge amount of difference. You know, it's it's a different thing than if you're, uh, let's say you're working on a vocal in a mix, you might have six, eight, twelve dBs of gain reduction at some point on a vocal yeah. channel, you know, and you might have a really atta short attack time because you don't want that kind of uh, uh, the the kind of all of the T's and the beginnings of the notes to kind of leap out at you and hit you in the you want it nice and controlled right um 
in mastering, I would never use those levels of compression because, I mean, it still might be right for the vocal. Let's you say you had a relatively dynamic, uncompressed vocal in the mix. You might want to use those kind of compression settings to control that vocal. But if you do, that's probably going to sound wrong for everything else that's in the mix. Right. So use that compression when you're mixing, not for mastering. Exactly. Well, use those compression strategies when you're mixing, right. not when you're mastering. I mean, and I mean, the great thing about mastering is sometimes you can achieve all kinds of outrageous stuff where you you get away with it, especially if you use multiband compression, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, it would in once you get to a certain point, it's always better to say, actually, I think it would be better to go back to the mix and tweak this. You know, I mean, if you're if you're mixing and mastering your own stuff, then that's easy. And for me, working with clients. There are certain points where I just say, you know, to get the absolute best result, I would recommend you do something a bit different in the mix um, to, to help them get where they want to go. So, yeah, because we're looking to be invisible in mastering, um, everything is pretty gentle, usually. So the exact settings of the attack and release get less critical. I'm not saying they're irrelevant, um, but... I, I spend a lot less time agonizing over them than some people do. <laughs> right, right. So you talked about multiband compression. How does that fit in? Well, multiband compression um, is like normal compression, except that it splits the audio signal into frequency bands, which is why it's called multiband. So I like to use, keep it simple and just have three bands. So I have one for the low bass, one for the mid frequencies, pretty much, and one for the high frequencies. And it's like having three separate compressors working on those areas of your mix. So you could have lots of compression in, say, on the, on the kick drum, and it wouldn't cause pumping or breathing in the high frequencies. Because, you know, a classic problem if you're trying to use a, a normal compressor on a whole mix, let's, let's say you've got an EDM track with a really pounding kick drum, is that... Every time the, the kick drum comes in, the compressor is going to grab the signal and pull the gain back. And if you've got, say, a synth pad up above it, you're going to hear that duck right. as, the, as the level comes down. Now, of course, there's a whole, uh, ever since Daft Punk, that's been a, a cool thing to do. And then, you know people use sidechain compression and stuff to achieve that effect. But again, I feel that's a mix decision, not a mastering decision, unless right. a client specifically asks me to get that effect. I don't want to achieve that in mastering. So that for me would be unacceptable. If I have a multiband compressor, I can use that fairly aggressive compression on the kick and the bass, say, and it won't cause that pumping in the higher frequencies. And it has a nice effect of kind of gluing the mix together. Um, I mean, it's something we can talk a lot more about maybe in another episode because it's, it's quite a big topic. But I mean, there are lots of people who kind of, lots of mastering engineers who just won't have anything to do with multiband compression. They're like, no, it's it's you know the spawn of the devil really um yeah absolutely. i've been afraid of my multi-pan compressor for a while and i'm just becoming friends with it well so the, the thing that i would say is the th with multi-band compression you know it's a classic with great power comes great responsibility <laughs> um it's a multi-band compressor can enable you to do amazing things with a mix and it can enable you to do atrocious things <laughs> with a mix <laughs> Um, my top tip to anybody who wants to play with these things is keep it simple. Uh, use similar settings to the ones we've already talked about and have the same settings in every band. Whenever I say that, people... Okay, what's your reaction to that? My reaction would be, why don't I just use a regular compressor? There you go. And the answer is because even though the settings are the same, the bands are doing something different, right? You could have... Let's, let's say it's something aggressive, so we've got four to one ratio and quite a low threshold, so there's lots of compression going on, lots of gain reduction. You can have lots of compression happening in the bass. You could really be squashing the, the kick drum and, the, and, and the, the low end, and it won't have any effect in the mid-range and the high frequencies, even though those bands have the same settings. Oh, uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah. And the thing is, if you don't do that, if you have different ratios and different attack and release times and all the rest of it in each of the bands, it gets really hard to figure out what the pff is going on. Um, whereas if you, well, my goal when I'm using a multiband is to try and make it as much like a single band as I can, but without that problem of, of causing pumping and breathing. I see. So, so, so that's why I don't have like six different bands. I only have three 
and I have wherever nine times out of ten I have the same settings in every band. And that means, yeah, it behaves very much like a normal compressor, except it has you you can do more compression with fewer artifacts, with fewer side effects. Um and that's what I would recommend anybody listening to this does as well if they want to give it a try. But um yeah, as I say, we can come back to that uh, more in a future episode. No, it's a very interesting tip. I would never would have thought of just keeping it level across the boards on a multi-band, but now it makes sense. I mean, that brings me to an interesting thing. Something else that I like to do when I'm mastering is I tend to not change the parameters on the compressor nearly as much as you might think. If you think back to when we were talking about limiting last week and I was saying, if you know what your mastering level is, you know what your meters are going to read, you've got your monitor set up with the right gain, if you put your track up at the right level, the right loudness, and there's no limiting happening, that's cool. Or if you put it up and there's actually quite a lot of limiting happening, providing it sounds good, that's also cool. Right. Same thing applies to compressors. I like to, I mean, maybe this goes back to the way that I used to work way back, the first time I was trained, but uh, my procedure is, you know, bring the level of the song up, listen to it. If there's some limiting happening, am I happy with the amount of limiting? If I'm unhappy with something about the limiting or if I feel that I need more dynamic control in the song, then I bring in the compressor. Uh -huh. But again, I have the thresholds set up. Now, I can't give you a number for this because it, it varies from compressor to compressor. But there's a kind of... Uh, for, for each type, there will be a point you can find, a threshold that you can find where you only start to get compression if there's too much dynamics in the signal. So if something, let's say on an album, you've got two songs and one of them has been heavily compressed and then the other one was done by another engineer in another studio and was very lightly compressed, you bring the heavily compressed song up and even with the compressor in the path, it's barely doing anything. Whereas you bring the song that's got very little compression to begin with in and because it's the dynamics are changing much more, there's lots more contrast between the loud and the soft parts, the compressor might be working a lot harder. Right. Um, so again, it comes to this, this minimal approach that I'm saying of, you know, do no more than is necessary I see. to get where you want to go. Um, and that means I'm rather than constantly tweaking the threshold and adjusting the makeup gain and all the rest of it with my compression, what I usually do is leave them pretty much as is and then just vary the level going in because we have 32-bit floating point processing in the in the audio workstation, so we don't have to worry about clipping unless you've got some kind of analog modeling stuff going on in the plugin. If it's a pure digital compressor, it doesn't matter if it peaks, providing you control it with a limiter at the end of the chain. Right. So you can just push the level up, let the compressor do its thing, and then adjust the settings as you need to. Huh. Um, so, you know, you, you listen to it and you go, okay, well, that's the compressor is working, but it's not doing enough. So I'm going to wind the in a higher ratio, or maybe I am going to reduce the threshold and the makeup gain in this case, because I want more compression on this song, but I don't want it to get any louder. You know, it's, I think it's a great way for, it's the way I was trained. And I think the, it's not like I'm saying you use the same approach on everything, but this kind of approach will work on maybe 70, 80% of stuff. And I think it gets you past the catch 22 because you follow the guidelines, you start to hear how stuff sounds and as you like it. And then when something doesn't work, then you know you have to really dig in and start adjusting all the parameters and getting a better result. I see. Rather than putting the song on and kind of randomly twisting the, the dials to get something you like, right. you know, which is where most of us, that's how I was until I was taught this, this strategy. I see. Um, and again, this is very much a mastering specific approach rather than a mix approach. That, um, that's one thing I'm learning from this. It's vastly different how you it, use these effects, even though that you use them in both mixing and mastering, how you use them is very different. Absolutely. Yeah. And and remember that, you know, the three M's that the, the mindset as well is the, the goal, what you're trying to achieve. You know, the whole thing about being invisible compression is a great way to achieve all kinds of creative effects when you're mixing. Um, ever since the Beatles, people have been using compressors to just mess sounds up right. and make them more interesting or, you know, uh, whereas for me, and, and there are mastering engineers who do it that way, but again, I kind of feel like that steps beyond the, it's another mindset thing. You know, my philosophy is if they wanted to to do that with compression, then they would have done it in the mix stage. Right. Um, and if you're working directly with a client and they request it, then 
I'm happy to to oblige, but it's not something that I would put onto a song without consulting them and getting their appro- approval first. I wouldn't either. Speaking of the three M's, is it time for our maxim? Almost. Oh. <laughs> I have one more thing. <laughs> Steve's like, what, there's more? <laughs> It's okay. This is a really quick one because this is a teaser. No, no, it doesn't have to be quick. I just thought I just thought it was time. That's all. It is about time. But so the one other thing I want to mention before we get to this week's mastering maxim is well, let, let me ask you this: uh, What do you think EQ has to do with compression? What does EQ have to do with compression? It's a broad question. Well, I think there are two different tools. And you could kind of achieve a similar thing with them, but I guess you have to know which one to use in which situation. I don't know the answer to that, Ian. Tell me. Tell me. I'll tell you. Um, well, this is kind of uh, leading on to the next episode because that's all about EQ. What I want to say just very quickly is that the EQ influences the way that the compressor reacts. So just to use a simple example, if you have a song where you put in a huge boost down at 50 or 60 hertz, that's going to bring out all the low end in the bass and in the the kick drums and stuff. That's going to cause more pumping if you're using a single band compression, if you're using a single band compressor, than if you hadn't used that EQ. Put it another way, if you boost up in the upper mids with an EQ to bring out all that kind of the vocal area, you'll hear more compression in response to the vocal than you would have beforehand. So the EQ of the sound going into a compressor has a big influence on what the compressor does and how it works. And for me, that's a really powerful tool in mastering because especially if you use a multiband compressor, it enables you to shape the sound or sculpt the sound even more. So what I'm just going to say very briefly is it's crucial when you're compressing in mastering to have a balanced EQ going in. Uh. Um, let's just think, of going back to that example with the kick drum, say you have a song where the kick drum is really pounding you put it through a compressor, it's a single band compressor, so you get some pumping and some breathing because of the the compressor reacting to that bass EQ. Then you think about the EQ and you think, well, there's too much low end, so you cut it back. You'll reduce the kick drum at that point, but you'll keep the pumping and the breathing from the compression. Whereas, if you spot that EQ imbalance before you start using the compression, and you reduce that low end in the kick and the bass, before it hits the compressor, the compressor will respond much more evenly to all the content in the mix. You won't need to apply EQ afterwards, and you won't have any of that pumping and breathing. I see. I okay? See. So, yeah. EQ, which we're going to talk about in the next episode, is, I mean, all this stuff interrelates, right? Because if you have less compression, you'll get more limiting. If you have more compression, you'll get less limiting, right. or it'll sound different. The EQ changes the way the compression sounds. All and in fact, we'll kind of bring all of this together when we get a couple of episodes down the line, when we kind of take a bit more of a, a bird's eye view of the whole process, because every time I work on a song, I kind of I have a little loop of things that I think about. Um, and I kind of go round and round in circles, getting closer and closer to the sound that I want. Um, and that hopefully will help people kind of find their way through this, what can seem like a pretty confusing set of... Uh, processes well plus also because we're doing it in this sequence purposely you're saying eq should come before the compressor exactly yeah. for me for me personally uh, that's i do use eq after compression sometimes um if you want to do that you need to be careful i find that you'll get a much bigger effect i mean that makes sense right if you boost 60 dbs of bass into a compressor but you've got a two to one ratio and three or four dbs of gain reduction you're not going to hear that whole 60 dB right. boost the whole time. When the compressor's working, that boost is reduced. Whereas if you apply EQ without compression, you're hearing the thing in full effect. But also, does the EQ influence the way the compressor works or not? So most of the time, I like to EQ into compression. Gotcha. Um, and people don't have to follow that rule, but that's that's my preference. It is a pretty um, pretty big question. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, there's two parties. I think there's two sides to that. I've, I've never seen anybody be definitive. Well, actually, no, I don't you, know. I don't know. I just, I've, I've heard some things online about what do you do first? Many people, let's just put it this way. Many people have that question. 
Yeah, and I think it's a valid question. And I think either approach can work. Yeah. But I mean, just thinking about it, going back to what I was just saying, if you don't have the EQ right before you hit the compressor, you won't necessarily get the result you want from the compressor. Yep. That makes right? sense. So, right. so I mean, I mean, you, some people do a kind of pre and post emphasis thing where they'll EQ a certain way going into the compressor and then they'll undo that EQ coming out because they want to hear the compressor working in a particular way. Right. Um, again, that for me, I think is getting, it's probably beyond the remit of mastering um, yeah. most of the time. But sometimes, you know, I mean, sometimes people come to me with EDM stuff and they want that kind of, that, that, that side chained effect. Um, and if you're going to do that, one way you can do that is a single band compressor, boost up the bass, get it pumping nicely, and then EQ that bass out again afterwards. So, you know, that can be one way to to get the result that you're looking for. So, yeah, as always, it's th there are no rules. These are just kind of suggestions and guidelines. But for me, 90% of the time it's EQ before compression in mastering. Sounds good. So now, here we are. Do you want to know what the mastering maxim is this week? Hell yeah, I've been waiting all show for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay i hope you're not going to be disappointed by it um it's basically always consider not using compression at all and if you remember the the when i initially said i was thinking about the maxim was when we were talking about that example of a song where the chorus sits really nicely and then the verse kind of drops back one thing you can do is add compression but the other thing you can do is just ride the fader, right? It's just ah. by hand lift the level of the vocal in the verse. And then maybe you don't need compression. Now, I'm not going to be quite that basic. The real maxim is consider riding the level into the compressor. So let's take the example of quite often I get stuff where the band have or the engineer have compressed something pretty heavily in the mix. Maybe they had some mix bus compression, you know, a compressor on the stereo output bus. Yeah. And I think they've gone too far. When I'm listening to it with my mastering... Uh, Mindset. <laughs> I was going to say hat on, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> it, it, with, with, the, with the mastering mindset. Um, actually, I'm feeling like the chorus is being held back too much by the compressor, right? The verse is working nicely for me and it gets to the chorus and it's just not kicking yeah. right for me so i will actually use automation to lift the level of that section of the song going up into the compressor to get that extra buzz of energy huh. out of the chorus or converse actually probably what's more likely is that i will set up the chorus and then reduce it in the verse to create that dynamic contrast and i mean i'm not talking about huge changes i mean i think you know these are kind of one two db maybe three dbs at the most but typically one or two dBs, you'd be amazed how much difference that makes. Sometimes I do it before the compressor. Sometimes I do it after the compressor. And the other way to do it is actually the opposite, where let's say the verse sounds really nice. You're really happy with the level of compression and the dynamic control you've got in the verse. And then the chorus hits and it's just sounding over compressed. It's just hit, you know, there's too much gain reduction going on. It's just hitting it too hard. You can then, this is always before the compressor, you can use automation or, you know, a fader to, to pull the level back going into the compressor. The interesting thing about that is it won't necessarily sound any quieter. It'll just right? sound more dynamic. It, yes, it will sound. And it, it will, yes, and. It just won't sound over compressed. I see. You know, it's, it's it's not so much that I'm looking in that. I mean, you can do it to try and get it to sound more dynamic, but it just rather than you know the sound of over compression when when things are over compressed, it's 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 like the guy who's smothered by the beanbag. You know, the boxer who's yep. who the beanbag is too close to him. He's not no room to swing his arms. He's just kind of flailing around. It everything gets clogged up um, and just too too dense. Um, you pull back the level going into the compressor a little bit, the loudest points will still hit just as hard, but there'll be a little bit more space in between them that just gives you that little bit of extra clarity, and it feels just as loud, but not so dense. And I guess having said all that, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's more dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> Good, man. I got something right. 
Uh, oh, you get plenty right. Thanks. Well, that's a good maxim. I like that. Very cool tips, man. Um, the more I hear about it, the more I want to master something. There you go. Give it a shot. I will. See what happens. I mean, I, it's an interesting point, actually, because there might be people listening to this who are kind of interested, but uh, either intend to use a mastering engineer or you know, just feel overwhelmed by the whole thing. Um, I still think it's it's good to play with this stuff, even if you're not planning to do it yourself, you know? Um, because I think by by kind of going through the process and getting more understanding of it, I mean, because I, I was unusual in my training. I started out as a mastering engineer um, and then moved on to do some recording and mixing and production kind of, at the same time. Uh, and it made you a better mixing engineer. I absolutely think it made me a better mixing engineer. I mean, one thing is I was working on mastering grade speakers in a mastering room. So that gave me a whole kind of extra level of perspective on what was what was going on. But yeah. So Rocket I, Fives aren't mixing grade, mastering grade, are they? <laughs> not really. I'm really sorry to say. <laughs> um, but that's not to say you need super expensive speakers for mastering, you can, you know, there, there's plenty, especially in these days. I mean, the the speaker technology in the 20 years that I've been working as a mastering engineer has has completely transformed. I mean, you really can get affordable speakers these days that sound so much better than they did back in the day. Huh. Um, but no, the the real thing is is knowing what can be done in the mastering process and what can't be done, kind of helps you know what you should be obsessing about at the mix stage. Right. Right. If you know that you can balance the overall levels and kind of control the fact that it the dynamics are a bit out wild for that particular section or all that kind of stuff once you know what can be achieved in mastering it, it helps you i it helps me just just be kind of more focused and uh more confident when i'm mixing and even when i'm recording because you kind of got that end goal in sight and that i don't know whether i mentioned it on this podcast yet but uh ken scott you know, the really famous Beatles engineer. Obviously, he was trained at Abbey Road. And back in the day when when he first started, you worked in the tape library first, and then you worked as a mastering engineer, as a cutting engineer, um, before you ever got anywhere near the studio because the limitations of vinyl were such at the time that you had to understand what was what the final format was capable of in order to do a good job of the, the stages that came before it. Wow. And um, and I've just thought that completely mirrors the way we're doing these podcasts, right? We're doing them backwards. We're starting at the end with the levels and then the limiter, and then we're working our way back because you need to understand how a limiter works and what the point of it is to know how much compression to use, and you need to understand how the compressor works so that you know what EQ to use and so on all the way back. So there you go. That's really cool. Anyway, anybody would think we'd planned this thing. <laughs> you don't seem like the planning type, Ian. You just kind of winged it, right? Um, I really do, <laughs> but there's a certain amount of, well, I've been talking about this stuff for a long time. Yeah. So. No. Um, as you're talking about like a lot of these guys doing mastering first before they're let anywhere near the studio, I can imagine to them originally, it's probably maddening. Like they just probably have this mad desire to like get in the studio and get on behind the SSL or whatever, but doing it the way that you did and Ken Scott did, it's gotta be so beneficial in the long run that they, they're probably all happy they did it in that, that way. I think so. And I mean, if you, to take an extreme example, when I, when I was starting out before I, I got my, uh, places as a trainee in the mastering studio, um, I went to see how things work at the BBC. Um, and back in, back at that time, the, the training you got working as an engineer at the BBC was second to none. But I was talking to a guy there who was doing sound effects for TV. And he was like, yeah, if I get another year or two, I might get onto the desk. <laughs> and And I said, another year or two. And he said, yeah, well, I've been here six or seven years now. So, you know, after about 10 years working, you know, starting out as a, as a, as a T-boy and then a tape op, and then now I'm doing sound effects and then I'll, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting up the mics now and, uh, you know, talking to the musicians, I might get to mix something. And at that point I thought, I don't have the patience to work for the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> but you did get an amazing training and an amazing, amazing insight into the whole process by going through that, that route you know so if you had the patience for it um it's it's kind of different these days the bbc everything has changed and and everything goes externally now so it's it's not the same but uh, yeah he probably became great when he finally got on the desk 
He was probably awesome, ready for it. I, I would say after 10 years, you would be, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, that was back in the day when you didn't even have, I mean, you maybe could get a cassette multitrack if you were lucky, if you wanted to play with this stuff at home. Right. Uh, you know, right. the technology we have these days just wasn't there. So, uh, yeah, the world changes. It does. I made, a, I made a full album on my multitrack, my cassette multitrack. It was a me Yamaha too. MT4X. Did you make one too? I didn't make one for me personally. I recorded an album for a band that, when I was at university. Um, we had a we had a Tascam. I can't remember the number. It was an eight track cassette recorder. It was nice. the first eight track cassette Porter Studio. Uh, it's I'd listened to it uh, last year sometime. It sounds pretty good, especially I, uh, when you consider. I know. I thought I listened to mine. It doesn't sound bad. And I was using drum machines and like just synthesizers. Anyway, those are working the with limitations, you know. It, Breeds creativity. It really does. No doubt. Awesome, man. Well, this was a great show. Um, thanks for bringing the goods, Ian. My pleasure. Really enjoyed it. I hope people uh, found something useful. If if you guys did, uh, please tell your friends. Please head over to iTunes or Stitcher. Uh, leave us a rating or a review. Um, it really helps get the word out, and we appreciate it. And... You know, we have all the shows posted and all the show notes and such over at themasteringshow.com. So head on over there, sign up for our mailing list as well. We got stuff for you to do. So there's no shortage of that. And any support you guys give us is very helpful. Ian, where can people find out more about you personally? And we want to sign up for your mastering course and other things. Everything is at productionadvice.co.uk. Um, and you can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, at Ian Shepherd on Twitter. And if you search for me on Facebook, you should be able to find me pretty easily. Sweet. And uh, I host shows over at edmr.com. That's edmmr.com. It's started out as mainly a EDM-centric show where I interview producers, but it's basically turned into just a lot of audio, just general audio stuff. So uh, head over there, listen to my other shows. You've got some cool stuff. I'm subscribed to several of your shows now. Thanks, Ian. That's awesome to hear. Now I get all the pressures on, man. I got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You got to bring the goods. Yeah, that's right. Well, hope everybody enjoyed this show. That's going to be it for the mastering show for today. Any last words for the folks, Ian? Enjoy using compression, and we'll see you next week to talk about EQ. Thanks for listening. See you later.